It's all come for Jesus. That's Revelation uh, 22, 20, and 21. Uh, the Bible ends with a prayer for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, come. Uh, you know, and, and Jesus uh, uh, Jesus promised in the, in the phrase before that, and then it ends finally with a benediction to all the saints. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. <clears throat> and remember last week we were talking about... Uh, uh, the, the, the things that Jesus expects us to do as disciples. Uh, we were talking about how the, the church in general, it, it doesn't teach Christians to anticipate with joy the return of Christ. Uh, it, it teaches the return in theory, but, you know, as a practical matter, you know, it could be a zillion years from now. And so it, it's a major part of the New Testament, though, the expectation of the return of and so this week, though, we're going to, you know, last week we, we had a couple of signs. And this week we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at a couple more things uh, that indicate that the time of his return must be very soon, must be close, you know, going to happen, you know. I, you know so, and by way of encouragement, we, we want to take a look at, at Mark 13, uh, 34 through 37. See, Jesus has just made the observation that the temple would be destroyed uh down to the last rock. And of course, the disciples, they were, you know, just astonished. You know, they thought that Jesus would come back to, to establish the, the kingdom. And that temple would be there for, you know, whatever, you know, a long time. And so, uh, and so, but they retired with Jesus. They went out to the Mount of Olives, you know, privately. And they, they questioned him about, what are you talking about? You know, what is this? What's, what's going on? See? And so uh, Jesus, he, he gave them a, a fairly uh, involved prophetic look into the future. Uh, you know, we call it the Olivet Discourse, and it's recorded in Matthew 24. It's also recorded in parts of it in, Math, in Mark 13 and in Luke 21. See, but each count is a little bit different from the other. You know, it's like uh, uh, there's some, you know, some leaves out these details and some others include other details that the other two accounts don't and so but we can surmise from that that the discussion it wouldn't have been a two-minute discussion you know we can read each of these accounts you know the all of that, that discourse we can read that in a minute but they had to have talked for hours it must have been long and involved we would, you know there would have been a lot of questions i can't see how it would be otherwise because the interest of the disciples would have they would have had you know, tremendous interest, and they would have had a lot of questions. Are you sure? What is, you know, what's going on? And so, uh, in any case, see, it's apparent that each of the writers, they, they recorded just those parts that were related to the point that they wanted to make. Now, the point is that it is that occasion that gives rise to this particular passage in Mark 13, 34 through 37. See, Jesus, he's talking about coming events. And these verses in Mark is his conclusion. This is how he it. He says, for the Son of Man, is, it's like a man taking a far journey. Um, he, uh, he left his house. He gave authority to his uh, uh, servants, to every man. He gave his work you know, and, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or midnight after cock crowing in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And he says an interesting thing at the end. He says, what I say unto you... I say unto all, that's us in Grayton. I'm telling you guys too, out there in Grayton, 2,000 years almost, down to the, you know, way down the end of time or into the times of the Gentiles. Watch, watch. You guys stay awake. You know, he wasn't just talking to his apostles. He was talking to us directly. He says so. See, and back in the beginning of his discourse, see, Jesus indicated there's going to be a period of history before the church age ended. He said there's going to be some time pass, so don't get all panicky. But that, you know, just because I don't show up right away, yeah, I, I have a purpose for that. So there's going to be some history happening in here. And so in, uh, this is Mark uh, 13, 7 through 9. So in verse 34, see, he compares himself to this man. He, that's why he said, I'm going to, he's like a man going on a far journey. That means history's going to pass. I'm going to be gone for a while. He's going to be gone for a long time. So he gives instructions to his servants, and that is us, you know, stuff to do while he's gone. All right, while I'm gone, here's what I want you guys to do. All right. And so he, he mentions he's given every man his work, 
whatever you do, raising family, whatever, preaching, whatever. You know, okay, everybody has their job to do, so go keep doing that. Uh, and then he points out nobody can predict the time, day of his return. See, uh, like I do all the time, you know, but nobody can do that. But I do it anyway. All right. So, you know, Tuesday, you know, that's that's the day of his return. All right. <laughs> but so far he's still waiting. Anyway, he makes it plain. He's talking to his this this church personally when he says, "What I say unto you, I say unto all." Watch. Okay, that's us. So disciples of Christ then are to watch for his return and to expect his return and to be alert at all time for the possibility of his return, which in general is ignored. Okay. So Jesus then is, he's interested. He's interested in our attitude about his return. He, he you know, he's, he, he, he wants us looking and waiting for him and expecting him. Okay. So. Just like uh, last week, see, I, I want to point to a few signs that indicate how close the coming is. It makes sense. I mean, this is the theme. You know, how close is Jesus you know, coming? I, I think, you know, very close. And so, um, and so he, he, you know, so just to be sure that he finds us awake and watching, he admonishes his disciples that day and us. Matthew 24, 32 and 33, he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. See, it's not really going to, the only way that Jesus is going to catch us off guard is if we ignore what he says, if we're asleep. And the way you're asleep is to simply not pay attention, you know, to not expect his return. He's going to catch you off guard then, that's for sure. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. There's going to be signs. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know summer is nigh. Is there's gonna be indications ahead of time. He's making that point. So you guys, you know, so so us, we'll have an idea of when he's coming. That that's his point. That's the point of the verses. So likewise, that's us. When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door, right away, soon, soon. It's gonna be soon. All right. So we'll take a look at some fig leaves then, right? Okay. So in his discourse, as Jesus, uh, he, he took his disciples on a tour of future events. He, he made a statement that must have seemed incomprehensible to them at the time. Not to us, but to him, to them. In Matthew 24, 21 and 4, uh, 20, wait a second here, 24, 21. That's not supposed to be 42. That's supposed to be 21 and 22. But anyway. Uh, that's a misprint. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> now you got it. Did he put 22 up there? 20. Wow, it's so good. Thank you. Yes, I need an editor badly. Okay, for then thou shalt, there shall be great tribulation, such as was not at that time, since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. See, and then he goes on to make it to this astounding statement. He says, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, for the elect's sake, those days are going to be shortened. Short sake. Jesus is declaring to his disciples that toward the end and before he returns, conditions are going to be so bad that the earth is in danger of being depopulated to the last man. Okay. Now, from their point of view, see these guys, what are they used to? They're used to catapults and swords and bows and arrows and stuff like that, right? How do you depopulate the earth with weapons like those? Well, you don't. You can't. You know, by the time you get done going from one end of the earth to the other, still, you know, there's more people having more kids. You know, you can't. You, can, you just, that's impossible. You see? And so, from you know, the weapons of war of those days were impossible to do the job that he was, you know, to, to bring about the conditions that Christ was talking about, that he described. Maybe a disease that kills everybody, uh, but in the worst diseases, see, some people always escape. So Jesus, he's pointing to a condition or a set of circumstances that were unknown to his listeners. Okay. Um, conditions that up to that time had never been experienced by men. A, a fantastic prophecy is what it is, you know, and a, a one that can't be understood 
by the people of those those days. Couldn't. Had no idea. It's an unbelievable prophecy, almost, except for the person who's given it. Okay, we know it has to be believed, but it's un- it's not understandable. That's for sure. See, but these days, these days, we know perfectly well what Jesus was talking about. We understand that. We ourselves live in constant fear of nuclear war. You know, North Korea comes to mind. We're liable soon to be engaged in nuclear conflict. On October 31st, 1960, the Soviet Union exploded the most powerful bomb ever devised. It's called the Tsar Bomb. And it had a yield of 57 million metric tons of TNT. I have no idea how big a block that would be. Just, it's a lot. It sounds like a lot anyway. A lot of, a lot of syllables. You know, 57 million. You know what? It could, be, uh, it could have been uh, calibrated to yield as much as 100 million metric tons of TNT, you'd see. But the problem, the reason they didn't was because the plane that was going to deliver that bomb couldn't have gotten away. You know, anybody that dropped that bomb was committing suicide. You can't get away fast enough. I know, I'll put the pedal to the metal. Not going to work, all right? And so this thing's big. You know, really, you would have just, you know, you couldn't drop it. You know, I don't know what you'd do with the thing. You know, but you're not going to fit it in a suitcase. Anyway, uh, you know, there's... You know, weaponized anthrax. That was unknown back then. You know, you can, you know, anthrax and a spray can, and you're dead. You know, you don't even realize it. You're going to die in a few days. See, now, the thing is, see, the weapons like these, which have the potential to end human life, it requires a couple of things to bring about, right? The first thing it has to have is a a large and wealthy population. Okay, even in World War II, see, only a few nations could even afford the research and develop development needed to bring the atomic bomb to reality. They didn't even know how to do it. They they tried several ways. They tried, you know, they were looking for ways to refine the U-235 out of the U-238 and the other elements of uh, the other isotopes of uranium. They tried centrifuges, gas centrifuges, gas diffusion. You know, I don't know how many you know, areas of research that they were going through, you know, that they tried out, but it took billions of dollars. Not every country could afford it. See, and so uh, uh, the second, see, is a, the second thing that's necessary is a scientific foundation, uh, you know, you, you, that, that's capable of directing research like that. I mean, all come in, all, all come in. Well, how do you pronounce that? You know, where you at? Remember they were trying to transmute lead to gold and like I, I I'm not pronouncing the word correctly, but alchemy. I'll say it again. Thank you. I it didn't sound right, but anyway, all right. That you know, it takes more than that. You got to understand the elements. You have to know what you're doing. You know, we can transmute lead to gold now. It's just expensive. You know, not worth it. Cost too much. But we had done it already. Anyway, um, and so uh, you have to have, uh, you have to know things, you have to know physics, got to know uh, metallurgy, got to know electronics, you have to know, and there's advances in genetics that have to come around. You know, anybody can do recombinant DNA. Every high school, you know, that has any, any kind of money teaches the kids how to do recombinant DNA. You can do it in your garage if you want, you know, some, some flake. You know, out in the Midwest, if you've got a garage, you got a garage against somebody, maybe developing some kind of germ warfare in his garage right now. Who knows? But it's out there, genie out of the bottle. We all know how to do it now. Okay. See, all these are hallmarks of a wealthy, populous, and scientifically advanced society. And we have that. The advance in knowledge, see, it was predicted by Daniel, too. That was uh, Daniel the prophet back in Daniel 12.4. But thou, o Daniel, this is, the, this is the, the angel talking to Daniel. You, you close up the word, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many are going to run to and fro that travel, lots of travel. Knowledge shall be increased. There you are. Your knowledge is going to be increased. You're not going to stay ignorant. Knowledge is the defining, knowledge itself is the defining characteristic of this age. That's what we have. It's the information age. Uh, knowledge, it's increasing at an ever-increasing rate even. The prophecy is abundantly fulfilled today. It's true. You want to know anything? Google it. <laughs> now we'll find out. 
right? I mean, a lot of stuff, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, trying to think of a situation or, a, you know, something I remembered vaguely. And, oh, here, go to Google, look it up, you know, it doesn't take very long. You know, oh, yeah, there we are. That was what I needed to know. Okay, you know, the knowledge is just there. You, encyclopedias are obsolete. <laughs> you know, they can't, they can't crowd enough information in them anyway. It'd be too big. Okay, you see in the passage also it makes two predictions at the same time, you know, also two other predictions. It says, it, it, see, it's, when the angel says, seal the book, even to the time of the end, see, that's a prediction, a backwards prediction maybe, that at the time of the end, the prophecy will be understood. You only seal it until the time of the end. At the time of the end, people are going to understand it, okay? And so, uh, and so it does. It, 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 not everything makes sense, but more and more all the time. Okay. So at the end, see, Jesus predicts a time of tribulation so great that it threatens the extinction of mankind. The shadow of that prophecy in the weapons available to man now looms over the world. We're not in a nuclear conflict. We're only maybe going to have one. But the Bible predicts that we will. Okay. And so in the prophet Daniel, see, he predicted the increase in knowledge that fuels the advances, the adva these advances in weaponry. Okay. So Jesus, see, in Luke 21, 26, he predicts this. He said, men's hearts, they're going to fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. They're going to be scared to death, men are. Well, that's true. It's true today. And you know what the really super rich people are doing? You can read article after article on the net about this, but they're that wonderful informational net. Okay, they about these guys. They're 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 digging their hidey holes. <laughs> they're they, they're making you know not just bomb shelters, but fantastic bomb shelters that that are huge and have tennis courts and all kinds of luxuries and and food for years, where they're just going to go down. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, when troubles come, they expect it. They're, they have a place now they can retreat to and hide out until the troubles are past. See? And so it makes you wonder, you know, what, uh, you know, what is this turmoil that, that so many of these guys see coming? What did they know that we don't? Nothing at all. <laughs> it's all right here. They don't know anything we don't know. But what do we know that they don't? Well, for one thing, we know that their bomb shelters aren't going to work. We know that. It's not going to work, buddy. <laughs> but go ahead. Give it your best shot. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting passage in Revelation 11, 17, and 18. See, and the occasion is the celebration in heaven as Christ is preparing to descend to reign on the earth. And the ones doing the speaking are those four and twenty elders that John sees back in chapter four, where they're introduced in Revelation chapter four. See, and it, and so they were saying, they were singing, we give. Well, they said they were singing, but I think they were singing, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry. See, it takes you all the way back to Psalm two. Nations are angry. And your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, that's us, you know, all the stuff. Okay, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and, sh and here's the, 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 the phrase that I want to look at, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Okay, you see that last phrase there. Those who destroy the earth, that, uh, the word translated destroy, yeah, you know, I've got this neat little thing on my informational notebook computer that you can just punch this button and it calls up all these Hebrew or Greek word terminology in this case. The word translated destroy, see, means to corrupt, to rot, to, to, to decay or pervert, okay? The, the accusation being made in the song, in this praise, is that one of the crimes of those who are about to be destroyed, those people who are about to be destroyed by the coming of Christ, one of their crimes is that they corrupted or rotted or perverted or destroyed the earth. That is, the land itself made it uninhabitable. 
See, the, now, those of us who have been around a while, we, we know about the Bikini Atoll. The, I, it means something to me. You know, I, I'm familiar with it. See, <clears throat> the United States had detonated some 23 nuclear devices on this island between 1946 and 1958, see. And so it, it rendered the island uninhabitable. Well, it had been inhabited, but they moved the people off. They said, well, we're going to blow up a few nukes, and then after we're done, we'll just move you back onto the island. <laughs> and the people believed them. <laughs> so they went, they moved. And so they, you know, <laughs> you know they, they nuked the daylights out of the island, and, and, and <laughs> they've never gone back. That's it. The island's gone. You know, I mean, not gone, but it's, you know, you, the radiation's still dangerous. You know, who wants to go back to that island? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I don't know why they had to have that island. They just could have chosen, but they wanted that one. All right. But I guess they had their reasons anyway. And so the, uh, the final war, see, they're going to involve weapons. Those wars were, are going to involve weapons that will render large portions of the earth uninhabitable and the people who are responsible for that will be judged for that too. See? And so hey, there's an example, like the prophet Jeremiah. See, he predicts that the time's going to come when, when Babylon will never be inhabited again. That's Jeremiah 15, 13. Babylon, it's mentioned in Revelations 18, 20, and 24 too. It says the same thing. Never going to be inhabited again. It's going to be birds and beasts and stuff like that. Gonna be in Babylon, not gonna, it's going to be gone. And people won't live there. Okay. And see, another thing, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is Israel. You know, back to Israel again. Israel is a central part of all of this. It's a tiny nation. You know, you, I, I just understand it's, it's just barely larger than New Jersey. And New Jersey is the fifth smallest state in the Union. You know, it's just a little teeny bit bigger now. I don't know, maybe the size of maybe Sonoma County. I, I don't know how big New Jersey is. California is a pretty big place. See, it's just, it's, it, it, you know, its population is around 6 million people. You know, it's, it's not very many. And yet, see, Israel, from the time of its restoration in modern times, and after 1948, it's uh, occupied a place that's front and center of the world's attention. Now, that's weird. I, you know, we have a, I, uh, whoever heard, hears of Liechtenstein, <laughs> that's a tiny nation too. Hey, you know, we don't spend much time worrying about what's happening in Liechtenstein. You know, in Liechtenstein, only the males vote, by the way. <laughs> <That's>, oh, <laughs> they're very politically incorrect, incorrect. So anyway, uh, you know, but Israel is a small nation. It should be just in the mix, but it's not. See, every time that Israel authorizes a new settlement in the so-called occupied territories, I, you know, a, a flurry of news articles happens that take note, and, and there's a, a, a flurry of condemnation that flows out of the United Nations. Oh, Israel's bad, condemn, 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 right? You know how it is. We're used to that. We see that all the time. You know, we don't even think about it anymore. See, but what you may not know is that that attention of the world, it was also predicted by the prophet Zechariah. It was about 2,500 years ago. Okay, In Zechariah 12, 1 through 3, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth out, this is identifying God, this is who I am, I stretch out the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, that's all the physics and everything that hold us together, and formeth the spirit of man within him, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Well, that's weird. When they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Okay? And in that day, this is verse 3, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Everybody, everybody, everybody's going to mess with it. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. It's going to be costly. Okay? Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Against this what? A little tiny nation? Yeah. How weird is that prophecy? Israel's at center of attention, just like it was predicted. We've seen them. This, today, in this, today has this prophecy been fulfilled in your ears. You know, and yesterday and the day before that, too. 
Notice who's speaking. He's the prophet. He's reporting the words of God verbatim. This is God. Now, he's just writing them down. Whatever God says, he writes them down. Okay? It's not a dream or anything like that. He, he says that not only will Jerusalem occupy the world's attention, but it's going to be a burdensome stone. Ah, you know, an irritant, a, 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 a difficult task, something heavy to lift. It's actually unliftable. And so it is. That's the way it is today. Two times removed from their land. Israel, absent from the land for nearly 2,000 years, they've regathered in, uh, to, to a nation again, and now after 2,500 years, Zechariah's prophecy has come to pass. So it is. It's insoluble. The Arab nations are implacable against Israel. Um, the Jews, they have their backs against the wall. Where are they going to go? They only have so much land, and they're stuck on it. There's no play. There's nothing to see. You know, President Trump is not going to bring peace to the Mideast. Not his position. Better not. That's for the Antichrist to do. But God issues this grim warning. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. A sober warning. You guys, watch out what you do. Okay? And that's a warning to us, too. The United States. We have a song that we used to sing. It begins with the line, <clears throat> we might still sing it. You know, I haven't heard it for a while. That was one of Rusty's favorite songs anyway. It begins with the line, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. All right. See, and, and I remember this one time we had a singing, and I was singing with somebody, and, and Brother Farmer was there. And so they started off, when the trumpet of the Lord shall, uh, shall sound, then time shall be no more. And you could hear his reedy voice going, be no more. You know, and the person next to me said, oh, he made that up. Well, yeah, I did. Fit in pretty good. <laughs> you know, I like it. Make up some more. <laughs> you know, the, like it was a sin. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, well, he did. <laughs> yeah, we could too. And so anyway, he, hey, hey, you know, it, it, uh, when I was young, see, I misunderstood that phrase. Time shall be no more. I didn't know what it meant. You know, time shall be. I thought it meant the end of time, that that was it. Well, that's not right. See, I, I, later, I came across the place in, in Scripture where this, the, the term's found. It's actually Revelation 10, 5 and 6. See. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, this big angel, strong, powerful, he lifted up his hand to heaven and he sware by him, I swear by the Lord that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and everything that's in there, and the earth and everything that's in that, and the sea and everything that's therein, that there should be time no longer. See, time no more. That's where we get it from. See, but here's the rest of the quote. There's more to it. And so the song doesn't lead us there. But in the next verse, it goes like this. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath delivered to his servants the prophets. That's what he's talking about. He's saying that time had come, that there's not going to be any more delay. Any more delay, uh, you know, the, the time's come for all the prophecies and scriptures that, that we were looking forward to, to finally actually become current events, to come to pass. See? And there's not going to be any more prophecies in the future after that. See, the Apostle Paul, he said that in Corinthians, 1 uh, first Corinthians 13.8. Uh, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. It's over. Done. Why? We're not going to need them anymore. We're going to be in heaven. <laughs> you know, we're, we're there. We don't need prophecies after that. You know, we, uh, uh, we're going to be living in that place that, 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 uh, that God has pointed us to since the garden. You know, <clears throat> the everlasting new Jerusalem, the city built without hand. We don't need prophecies there. Prophecies of what? You know, prophecies of, well, tomorrow uh, the joy will increase. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. Well, tomorrow is going to be really good. <laughs> you know, and there's not going to be any clouds. And, and you know, we, we, you know, what prophecies? Okay, it's done. Um, you see, the long delay, though, is, it, is nearly at an end now. Yeah. Oh, when time shall be no more. And the day star arises in our hearts forever. See, so soon that long delay is almost at an end. Almost at an end. So, 
Now it's time for the invitation. That's what we have to look forward to. And we're there on the cusp at the, right here at the edge. It's at the, at the door is what Jesus said. No, that it's at the door. Well, it is. See? And so the invitation then is to the God of the future and the past and everything in between. Like Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. We're going to wrap it up. So the invitation is to the God of the joyful return, the return of the King, and he's coming for us. See? 